Hello and welcome to another Roll for Crit interview. Today, I am joined by someone who has a huge experience when it comes to card games, being a player, a judge, a playtester, and now they can add to the resume a successful card game Kickstarter in their new game, World Breaker. Thank you so much for joining me, Ellie Amir. Thank you for coming on to Roll for Crit. Thank you, Will, for having me. I'm really excited about this conversation. So first off, why don't we start with maybe people who don't know who you are. Uh, how did you come into this space of tabletop and cardboard? I've been playing since I was a kid. I started with Dungeons and Dragons when I was six and Magic the Gathering when I was 11, if I recall correctly. And there was Talisman at some point. Oh my gosh. Um, <laughs> Talisman, what a, what a game, what a treat. Um, yeah, so I've been always messing around with homebrew adventures and tiny games. And it's been a dream of mine to design and publish something for 30 years at this point. And uh, over the years, I played a whole bunch of games. Uh, when I was 18, Settlers was just coming to Israel and everybody was blown away by it. And from their point, it's been accelerating so quickly, right? We had Settlers for a oh, few yeah. months and then Puerto Rico and Kalis and um, I forgot the name uh, with like you build a dungeon. It's like Dungeon Keeper, but the board game form. Um. Oh my God. Uh, dungeon Lord. Oh, okay. I was thinking Clank when you are. Oh yeah, Clank is more modern. <laughs> yeah, and uh, one of the big big games in 2012, Fantasy Flight Games, were uh, rebooting Android Netrunner, mm -hmm. and I read about Netrunner in the Duelist which was the Wizards of the Coast magazine in the 90s. So for you Zoomers out there, we used to get news <laughs> via paper in the mail. And uh, I was really excited about the game and I never played it because it was never imported to Israel. By the time I immigrated to the US, it wasn't a thing. But then Fantasy Flight rebooted it. I love Cyberpunk. I love Richard Garfield. I played the hell out of Netrunner. I organized tournaments, one of the first tournaments in the US. And um, we hosted uh, Lucas Lissinger, the, uh, the designer, a couple of times in New York, which was a lot of fun. And when Netrunner went out of print, when Fantasy Flight lost the license in 2019, I started thinking about my own game. It started as a Netrunner reboot. Then a group of fans called Null Signal Games rebooted the game, and they're doing a splendid job. So. They took that. I don't need to deal with it anymore. I just started my own game. And this is how World Breakers came to be. I mean, that makes perfect sense. I feel when it comes to those who are fans of trading card games, it's very likely you've played at least one game that you enjoyed that ended. That seems to be, I mean, Magic the Gathering is still going strong and there are a couple other big titans, but every now and then a game has come and gone. And I find it interesting, maybe just because I wasn't paying as much attention back when I, you know, the first guard game I can think of that ended was actually an Alien Predator one. But, you know, Netrunner, like you said, also Transformers, I know, actually had people, once it ended, say, mm, we're not done yet. We're going to try and make our own cards. So how, what's it like to be in that sort of the, it's like you're sort of leading the charge, but you also aren't, you know, the company. So how does that work in those fandoms? Like when it comes to designing cards and sets? I think that the word you've used, fandom, is a great fit. And I'm used to, like, I usually use the word fandom in the context of Star Trek, Star Wars, uh, the furry community have their fandom. But I think it, it's a good description for games and collectible card games in particular are very much a lifestyle hobby where <laughs> you can dedicate all of your time to them. And, you know, if you're not playing the game right now, you're talking to your friends about it. And if your friends are not there, you're reading forum posts or you're just watching YouTube videos or going on Board Game Geek. And if none of that is available, you just sit there brewing decks in your mind. Like, I, I used to go swimming as a kid. I hated it. It was so boring. And the trick was, as I was swimming, I was building Magic the Gathering decks. Uh, and it was a great way to pass the time. So given that they're lifestyle hobbies, it's not, when you think about it, it's not surprising that so many of them have continuations. And Star Trek, the Decipher card game, has a very active 
community. They've released, I think, over 40 expansions over the years. Um, Middle Earth The Wizards, I was a huge fan of the game. I played it more than Magic the Gathering. Between my friends and I, we had thousands of cards. The game, Ice, the company, stopped publishing it. Uh, a fan-run group called the Council of Elrond took over, and they released a bunch of content. Um, and you mentioned all of us lost games. Another one is Babylon 5, which mm. was a really clever game ahead of its time in many ways. In particular, it was designed as a four-player game, uh, which is something that most companies don't do right now. Sadly, again, the company stopped publishing it. Um, and finally, there's Netrunner that actually died twice. Once the 1995 incarnation and mm -hmm. then the 2012 incarnation. So I think that these are fandoms. And I think that all fandoms have the, the trailblazers, the pioneers who are ahead of everyone else. And in this case, the pioneers just make their own content. And it's usually a group of people that care deeply about the game. And they just build a system that the company had. They really try to mimic it. Sometimes it's more formalized, not all signal games, that the group that is making Netrunner, they're very well structured. They're transparent with their blog posts. They're talking about the, the org chart. Um, I believe they're incorporated as a nonprofit. Hmm. So they really have all the pieces. Others are a bit more informal. So the Middle Earth one, the Council of Elrond, I think it's just a group of players that, you know, nobody else is doing it, so they're doing it. But at the end of the day, it's just about delivering content. You know, this mm -hmm. is how these games work. It's always about getting new cards and new variants. That's the lifeblood of these games. So that's what the players do. Yeah, I mean, that's always whether they are doing it on time or too much. It's always striking that balance. And... I really like a lot of things you said, first off, the lifestyle when it comes to card game hobbies, because you know when you talk to someone who's really avid, the way they talk about it is the same way as a sports team. Match the Gather being the very easy one that most people get, you know, I'm an aggro player, I'm a red mage, like, you know, like you identify as a specific mechanic, color, group in that card game that sort of speaks to you. Uh, it doesn't have to be magic. It can be plenty of the other card games. Usually if there's something that really jives that player, that's their player's deck, which is why I think if they didn't get the support they wanted, if the game ends, it becomes like, well, I need that support. I need those extra fine little few cards that make my deck shine. Now, I do want to say, and I'm curious on your thought on this, that I feel Netrunner's, the way Netrunner ended was a bit weirder versus some of the one, other ones I know. I feel... At least the ones I play were based on a property like a Transformers, like Alien, that, you know, maybe didn't sell as well as the company wanted or whatever. Netrunner, to my knowledge, was more of that the mechanic, I was going to say life's copyright, I don't, I can't think of the right word, belonged to Wizards that they leased out to Fancy Flight and that ran out and they just never didn't renew it. So to my knowledge, that's more of like a, a bit of a weirder legal space. But what do you think of games that do revolve themselves around a specific show property? Because we're seeing a whole bunch pop up recently. I mean, Lorcana for Disney is coming out later this year. They just announced a new Star Wars Unlimited. So we'll see how that goes. Bandai has been pump pumping out a bunch, which actually have been doing relatively well. And I am a little biased on one, but I will say that at least they seem to be selling well according to my local uh, game store. That's a that's such an interesting question. And I, a lot of people were sad when Fantasy Flight announced that they're not continuing with Netrunner. And it was all very sudden because they just got a new lead designer uh, whose last name I forgot, Briggs, I think. And they just announced the new expansion. So it didn't really seem like Fantasy Flight is winding it down. Mm -hmm. And I will briefly say that, so this is a German magazine. I don't know if you can see it well. Uh, it's a gaming magazine. It's run by, I, to the best of my knowledge, entirely volunteers. And uh, they actually had an article about Warbreakers uh, in the latest issue. <laughs> I don't know if you can see it well. Oh, I, I mean, I can see the main title. And in the, the okay, image, good. yeah. And um, the, um, the, the, the journalist who's writing it, he goes by Thessaloniki online. I think he's working on a bit of an oral history 
of what happened with Netrunner at Fantasy Flight because mm. he's been asking me a lot of questions and it sounds like he's asking other people and hopefully he can unveil it. Um, the, I guess the, the leading hypothesis in my mind is that Wizards just bumped the licensing fee significantly mm -hmm. because Kamigawa Neon Dynasty, which is a cyberpunk themed Magic the Gathering set was in the works. And they saw some sort of competition between that, or even they might have considered rebooting Netrunner themselves, the Kamigawa uh, uh, kind of franchise, which sounds completely out there, but who knows what Wizards thinks. Um, so I think that was that's the leading theory, that they just bumped the licensing fee and, and mm -hmm. Fantasy Flight did the math and it didn't work out. One of the things I noticed is that over the years, and this is entirely my belief, not substantiated, I think Fantasy Flight had a philosophical shift regarding their LCG line, their living card games, whereby I think they understood that LCGs have a limited time lifespan um, and that the more expansions you release, onboarding new players becomes more difficult and also getting retailers to stock your product becomes challenging. Um, retailers, stores don't like dedicating a whole aisle just for the expansions of your LCG. And I think that Fantasy Flight has shifted their approach into retiring the games after a few years or rebooting them. So for example, that's what they've done with the Arkham Horror LCG. They rebooted the base box. It has a lot of content. It removes some of the expansions from the market. It's easier to convince new players and stores to hold it in stock. They've done it with the Game of Thrones as well. They rebooted it the second edition a few years ago. So I tend to believe that there was an expiration date on Android Netrunner. I think it would have happened sooner or later. And I think that Wizards of the Coast just fast-tracked hmm. that, that, uh, that fate by bumping the licensing fee. And again, this is entirely just hypothesizing on my end. I mean, yeah, there's a lot of things we don't know. And I never made the connection that uh, Neon Kamigawa probably in the works when the cancellation happened. But I do wish at least Fantasy Flight would do something because they still technically have the world of Netrunner. If, or Android. So the world. Android, Android's Android. world and Netrunner's the mechanic. I always mix those up. <laughs> and that's fascinating to me because the 1994 Netrunner was built off a different cyberpunk role-playing game mm -hmm. whose name I forgot. It might have just been Cyberpunk. <laughs> and then Fantasy Flight rebooted it in 2012, and they already had a they already had a cyberpunk world in the form of Android, which is an incredibly complex, convoluted, and weird board game, which I strongly recommend you try, just because it is such an experience to play it. It is it's flawed and it's amazing. Um, so they took the world of Android and they built Netrunner into that world. Mm -hmm. And the world of Android is really cool. Oh, I, lo very... no, I love the world. Yeah. Oh, yeah. It's, 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 it's a very cool world. It is a non-dystopian cyberpunk. And it keeps the core tenets of cyberpunk, which is pretty much capitalism gone completely <laughs> out of control. But there are elements of hope and optimism within the world. There is a lot of shades of gray. And in the cyberpunk world, usually the corporations are evil. And I would argue that in the world of Android, there are both positive and negative facets for the corporations. Um, they're still releasing Android products, including a role-playing game, I think. I'm not sure. They, I yeah, I think they had their own special line of role-playing. Now, I have a bad feeling that if I let this continue, we can just go on and on about Netrunner. I, as I hadn't had a chance to talk about that with anyone in quite some time. But there are other games out there, including the one that you just not only successfully funded, I should have looked up the actual fund date, but this is actually going out now. Like People are playing this game, and that is World Breakers. <laughs> I should have prepared a box in advance. <laughs> so yeah, World Breakers, it exists. Uh, it's a game. It got funded via Kickstarter in March last year. 
we shipped it to backers uh, six weeks ahead of time. Perfect. Which, yeah. To my knowledge, is unheard of in the world of board gaming, especially for a first time publisher like ours. Um, yeah, it's definitely doing a whole lot better too, considering all the news happening around uh, Siege 6, but that's a yes. whole other uh, boat. <laughs> Speaking of tangents that could employ us for a long while. Absolutely. But I do want to focus on the card game aspect here because it's, it's very interesting. First of all, if it wasn't obvious from how we were talking so much before, it's a card game and this would fall under the ECG. It's the same thing as an LCG. It's just copyright naming stuff. Uh, so you're not buying packs and that's not planned for packs in the future, correct? Yes. Yeah. Let me give the, the quick spiel. Yeah, so absolutely. World Breakers is a card game for two players plus it has a solo campaign uh, which people seem to be enjoying and uh, thematically the game is set in the 13th century and we are in asia uh, we're in mongolia and persia to be precise and um, one of the unique aspects of the game at least from the direction that you're saying is that the game is entirely self-contained so you buy the box there's enough cards for two players to play, either pre-constructed decks, constructed decks, or a two-player draft format that we've adapted for the game. So the goal with producing this was to create as much replayability as possible. You know, you're watching a show on Netflix and the season ends with a cliffhanger, and then the show is canceled and everyone's like, why did you put a cliffhanger? <laughs> I did not know if there's gonna be any more World Breakers content, I wanted people to get a bang for their buck. So when you buy the box, there's already tons of replayability in it. I've modeled it more as a board game than as an LCG or an ECG. So the goal is really that players shouldn't feel committed to buy all the products. Stores should not feel committed to stocking all the products. Like whatever you have is fine. Um, so with that said, I am super excited that I've announced an expansion a few weeks ago, and uh, it's going to be called the Indigo Sisterhood. Uh, it's going to be funded by a Kickstarter. Uh, with a f the campaign date is less in next month, so right now the plan is to launch the campaign in early June. And if you're listening to this YouTube video, please go to our website and follow the campaign. We'll have a link uh, down below as soon as that is available, so you can just quickly click that. But yeah, I actually do want to talk a little about expansion because what I've read about it. So first off, I guess, let me backtrack really quick. When I first got this, I assumed, oh, this is going to play like Magic or Netrunner. It's a dueling game. And definitely it is. Don't get me wrong. But I did not know about the solo campaign action in there. Mm -hmm. And I have not played that yet because I wanted to try and play the game earlier in which I learned the very important lesson of don't give the aggro player the aggro deck as it, you will not survive. <laughs> But what I found was interesting is that when I saw the expansion, one, that uh, I believe that you're going to add some hybrid color groups in there. But the campaign seems to continue from where the other one left off, like story-wise. So now I'm really curious because at first, like I said, Netroid, uh, Netroid, wow, Android and Netrunner, the kind of idea. But now I'm seeing Arkham where there's a story progressing, and I'm really curious of how you – think about that because you the i feel like these do combine two very different mindsets yeah so i'll start by saying why i think world breakers is awesome um the thing about netrunner and the reboot of netrunner is that the game was designed in 1994 mm -hmm. um, and it was probably designed beforehand we have learned a lot about gaming technology over that period and one of my goals with World Breakers is to make the game as simple and as accessible as possible. Like this is super polished to the level of you open the box, there's already decks prepared for you. You just shuffle them and you start playing. And I have people who started playing after five minutes. Like you, especially if you've played card games before, you're gonna scheme through the rules, you know how to play. Um, so it was really about bringing that level of polish and making the game as elegant and fast-paced and strategic as possible. Um, so that's one part of it. And another part is the story and in particular, the history. 
So the game is set in the 13th century. And there is a fantastic element. There's this resource called Mythium that lets people do cool stuff, which mm -hmm. is not part of our history. But I have done a lot of work to stick to our history. So for example, the campaign starts with Marco Polo. Uh, you're playing Marco Polo, the Venetian trader, which I'm sure most of our audience knows. Mm -hmm. And you're in China and you're going back to Italy, uh, which is something that happened um, in our world. And the journey is different because again, it is a fantasy element to it, but a lot of the waypoints are the same. Like the history is there. And when you finish that part of the campaign, you start another mini campaign with another character. Her name is Kutulun, and she's a Mongolian warrior princess. She's a bona fide historical figure. Mm -hmm. And one of the few women you find in the history of the Mongol people. Um, she's, a, she's a big thing. When you go to Mongolia, when you speak to people from Mongolia, they know her as a folk hero. And I wanted to put her in the game as this like fantastical, amazing leader of the Mongol people. And again, you follow her story, not in our history, but what could have been in this alternate, somewhat fantastical 13th century. And the expansion is going to continue the story, um, this time with a fictional character. Uh, her name is Miriam, and she's this diplomat that was sent to meet with Kutulun and talk to her about some big, heavy political stuff mm -hmm. that is going in the world. Um, and one of the things that they discovered is that there's this huge mine of Mithium called the Indigo Grotto, which everyone thought is a myth, but it's actually a thing. It actually exists. And now we're starting this race where who's going to be the first one to reach the Indigo Grotto and figure out what's its importance in this grand scheme of things. Um, so the next part of the story, you're going to play as Miriam, and you're going to start by chasing Marco Polo because he actually knows where the grotto <laughs> is located. Um, and from there, you're going to make your way to the grotto itself. I'm now really curious because I did know that at least the ones I knew like uh, were based on real people. For example, the uh, Mongolian princess you mentioned. Correct me if I'm wrong. Like she ha had a like I don't know if it's real or the legend is that you had to beat her in wrestling to marry her, and that never happened. So, a lot of our knowledge about that period comes from Marco Polo's journal, Marco Polo's The Travels of Marco Polo, um, which is a piece of writing he wrote while he was in prison. Um, and it's quite clear that a lot of it is just blatant lies. <laughs> uh, that's not a big surprise now, is it? One of the things I've done with Warbreakers is at least some of the game's history comes from uh, primary sources. So when you do historical research, there's primary sources and there's secondary sources. Primary sources is what people actually wrote during that period. Secondary sources is what people wrote about that period over the years. And primary sources are notoriously difficult to work with, especially for that time period, because these people sold books. And the way you sell books is by making them exciting. So it's quite clear that Polo made a bunch of stuff up. It really seems like that particular story probably was made up as well. But for the history of Worldbreakers, that story is true. And for the history of Worldbreakers, Kutulun is this amazing fighter. Um, and in fact, one of the cards is called Confident Suitor. And it's based in basically a Mongolia, this huge Mongolian fighter. Uh, and it's clear that he wants to, uh, to, to beat Kutulun in a fight. Um, and then in a later card, you see the same character and he now, he's now a, a bartender pretty much. <laughs> so it's quite clear from the flow of the game that he didn't make it. Uh, he didn't pass the, uh, the gauntlet of, uh, of, Kotulo, of Kotulun's, uh, wrestling. I'm really interested in how you do like look through, cause these, like you said, these are real people, but at the same time, when do you decide on the myth, when do you add a character? as you mentioned, for the expansion. Because, I mean, let's be honest, if you change and add a, what was it? I'm always blank on the name. Uh, Mytherium? Mythium. Mythium. You know, probably some new people are going to show up that maybe we didn't hear about. 
So how do you decide where to go and make sure it still feels like you're not just throwing in, you know, an elk and a uh, not an elk, an elf and a dragon, you know, and really go full fantasy? That's a great question. And I think that there's two main sources which I use for inspiration. The first one is I'll preface by saying I love alternate history. It's oh, a, yeah. I love the genre. Uh, it's a very polarizing genre. You speak to fantasy flavor fantasy fans, they hate it. <laughs> um, I, I, I really enjoy it. The big two sources of inspiration, the first one is The Man in the High Castle by Philip K. Dick, which envisions a reality in which uh, the Reich won World War II and how the world looks uh, as a result of it. And it's a big shift. A lot of things are changing, but he keeps enough things familiar and he incorporates enough elements that the reader will say, hmm, I could see that happening. That makes sense to me. So that's one of them. The second one is Lovecraft Country uh, by Matt Ruff. And that is, I think, one of the most brilliant Call of Cthulhu inspired books I read. Um, and in, uh, in Lovecraft Country, there is magic in the world. And the period is the, um, the 60s, it's Jim Crow. Uh, the protagonists are a black family who are being targeted by a group of white wizards for reasons that are discovered over the plot. And when you listen to Matt Ruff, to his podcast and his blog, one of the things you notice that he's talking about is that the magic is not strong enough to break through our history. So the magic is there, the magic is, it has an impact, but the impact is local. It's not going to rewrite history. Mm. And that's something I've been trying to do with Wall Breakers, where at least the starting point is very faithful to our history. And now, you know, we're going to distance ourselves from the real history, but there is still going to be enough familiarity for people to say, OK, that makes sense. Yeah. To me, what I've experienced so far it definitely feels more like it's not like it took a hard left or right, more like a slight bump because of this, where you still see and things make sense of what you might expect during that time, just, you know, with things maybe glowing or maybe something fun or interesting discovered. It's one of those things that's nice if you're someone who really likes theme and wants to get feeling because it feels like, yes, this all makes sense. This is what I expect would happen. And I'm not all of a sudden in a rocket ship. Yes. And early in the design of the world, the the magic, the mythium mm -hmm. was a lot stronger, like we had elements like teleportation and we had these huge weapons. And at some point we were toying with time travel, which is always a bad Ooh. idea. <laughs> Don't do it. Um, so, and as development progressed, both on the mechanics of the game and on the story of the game, we made magic weaker and weaker and it does less. And the reason is it just felt much more interesting to do it that way as opposed to, oh, suddenly someone has a rocket ship in the 13th century, as you pointed out. I'll admit, I think a lot of stuff I watch, and I do watch plenty of shows or where characters, you know, have those time-breaking, world-breaker abilities, whatever. But I'm more interested in the characters that have, like, a little bit stronger, you know, and how they use some weird ability that isn't, like, crazy, but how they have to tweak and work around it and how they have to be creative about it. And I feel it's a bit more closer to that than... I can Certainly. nuke a continent. The big inspiration for magic in fantasy is Dungeons and Dragons. Um, and Dungeons and Dragons is fun when you play it, but it's really boring when you read it. And there's a whole armada of Dragonlance fans who are Googling my address <laughs> as they're listening to this. But I think you, know, you just pissed off every person who watches the live D&D streams and shows. I think they're great performances, but when you start adding stuff like teleportation and it's and even you know fireballs throwing fireballs and wiping out a whole i don't know platoon of goblins running your way because it's always the goblins that we kill <laughs> it's just not interesting and in wall breakers we've been struggling with finding ways to make magic interesting so kutulun's power is that she forms an empathic bond between her people. Um, and the reason that she's managing to reunite the Mongol people is one, because she's a, an amazing leader and very charismatic. 
we do have he, we do have evidence for this in the historical record, by the way. Oh, um, that she was that kind of person, but also because she just shows them that we should really work together. Like this is what it's all about, and it's a very subtle magical power um, that you wouldn't see in a TV show. You wouldn't even see it in Dungeons and Dragons, maybe because it's not cinematic, unless you make it cinematic and. With Wallbreakers, we've worked really hard on making it interesting and cinematic and impactful from a narrative point of view. And we've been focusing on the narrative because I'm a sucker for that. But this is, you know, there actually is a fun game here as well. And the first thing I want to talk about was how did you land up on the four guilds? And how do you plan to expand on that? Is it actually based in history? I was really curious if like, something like this pointed out? Is it simply just, we needed something like this for the game? And especially with the multicolors coming out in the next expansion as well. So one of my friends who was the first, one of the first people to play test uh, at Wallbreakers said that he loved the game because I stole the best elements from all the games <laughs> he makes. So for example, the resource system in, in Wallbreakers is pretty much Netrunners, where you have Mythium, which is money, you have cards in your hand, which is the stuff that you do. And then every turn, you take four actions. And as an action, you can always take more money or draw more cards. So if you've played Magic the Gathering as an example, you know how frustrating it is to sit there, either with no resources or with lots of resources, but nothing to do with them. And the same is true for more modern card games like Hearthstone. It's very easy to get stuck with the wrong cards for the current moment in the game. In Wallbreakers, we solve this because you can always spend one of your actions to get more resources. It might not be the most tempo efficient move, but sometimes you just need to do it. Mm -hmm. The guilds, they were blatantly stolen from Magic the Gathering. And as I was developing Wallbreakers, I was watching a Magic the Gathering, a Magic Arena streamer called CGB or Covert Go Blue. And he's a great showman. I really enjoyed his streams. He's also a phenomenal marketing person, which <laughs> is what most streamers fail on. Um, and he has a whole persona of when he plays the game. And he repeatedly says, this is not who I am. This is the persona of, of me. And CGB loves playing these like, crunchy control decks that sometimes don't even have win condition. He just wants to grind the game until the opponent concedes. Like the opponent is tapped out literally and figuratively. They have no resources and they just lose. And CGB's nemesis are these hyper aggressive decks that usually red like burn decks that just win the game by throwing up all of their <laughs> stuff on the board, like vomiting everything. And, you know, it's gonna, I'm just going to vomit everything at you and you're going to die. And if you're not going to die, I'm going to lose. I have nothing. Like, I'm, I'm just <laughs> taking my cards and throwing them at your face and you're either dead or I lose. And these were the first two decks that I designed for Wallbreakers because it's such a tension that repeats itself in card games, the aggro versus the control. Um, so the control became the moon guild and the aggro was the sun guild and then they became the earth guild. Um, so that was that. The void guild was stealing mid-range decks from magic. So magic, there's this spectrum of aggro to control. And then at the center, there's mid-range decks that they can, they have a lot of fuel. Like they have a lot of fuel, they keep running their engine and they usually, they're really good at managing their resources. Like they can't really control the game. They can't really kill you quickly, but they can persevere, um, which is an archetype which I really enjoy. And finally, the Stars Guild, they're based on control decks and combo decks where you have all these pieces and they connect and then something amazing happened. And this is where I borrowed heavily from Netrunner. Um, in my heyday as a Netrunner player, I used to play a deck called um, Astro, uh, Astro Fast Advance. Mm -hmm. And it was such a frustrating deck to play against because it's all these different pieces of a combo that 
let you get points and there's nothing your opponent can do about it. Um, and in Netrunner, it quickly became frustrating because the tools were too strong. In Warbreakers, we put this into the Stars Guild and we've done a lot of playtesting to make sure that it's not broken. Um, but it's this like combo deck, it's this glass cannon that just just wait, just wait, give me like five minutes, five <laughs> minutes, don't kill me five minutes, it's gonna be fine. And then they win. Um, so the guilds came from the mechanics and then it was about building the story about them. But this is really one place where the mechanics came first and then the story showed up. I mean, that makes perfect sense as I imagine as this game grows, that's where people are going to be like, you know, I'm a moon player, you know, that they connect with their guild. And I find it interesting. You do mention how they're combo players, because if for those who are big into any card game, let's be honest, almost I think any card game has this. When you think of a combo player, you think of someone says, all right, it's my turn. This and this and this and this and this and this. Oh, I get an extra turn. This and this and this and this. You know, you start to walk away and get lunch and come back and see if they're done. But for those who don't know, in World Breakers, you take turns back and forth to do one action. Yeah, so there's you, no turn. You're, there's no real, I'm going to just hog up this 30-minute session. It really feels like you got to think of your one move and back to you. Yeah, at least for me, it usually kept me in to know that I'm not like, all right, Here's my, my turn's done. I'm going to just wait 10 minutes or something. You know, I was going to know what was going to happen very fast and then have to know how to react just as fast or fail and to I, react in my case sometimes. And I feel that this is the one mechanic that really makes wall breakers unique. And I think this is one thing which is mine. Like mm -hmm. you don't see it in other games. This idea that as the game progresses, uh, you keep flipping turns between you and your opponent. And uh, it all comes down to this round tracker piece, which hopefully shows up. So you put your token here, you do your thing, and then the token goes up here, and then it's your opponent's action. And an action is tiny. An action is gain one resource. An action is play one card. So they're going to play a card, and it's back to you. You cannot react. Um, so it goes back and forth, and you, you will never have the feeling of you're just sitting there and not doing anything because your opponent cannot hog the attention. And the interesting thing is when you get down here, so your opponent, let's say you're the blue player, mm -hmm. you played your last turn. Now we're gonna flip and now you're first. So you play, you zigzag, but every other round, you're gonna have two turns, one after the other. And this is your opportunity to do crazy stuff. Yeah, I, um, I've learned that's something I I learned that I need to focus a bit more on as I didn't plan a bit. My first match was actually Marco Polo. That was me versus my opponent who uh, played the aggro uh, Mongolian. And let's just say I uh, was not very good at defending. <laughs> so Marco Polo is really about finding the timing windows. And it's interesting. And this is a lesson for the designers out there. We built the game around Kutulun and Marco Polo as your first matchup. One, because uh, from a story perspective, these are the main protagonists. And two, from a mechanics perspective, they're at the opposite end of the spectrum. Kutulun is all about playing followers and attacking, and Marco Polo is all about playing locations and using them to gain points. I have never seen a game where Marco Polo attacked and won. So. <laughs> In fact, in the solo campaign where you play Marco Polo, we deliberately tell you, you cannot attack. You just don't do it. And if you ever play Marco Polo and you think, hmm, I should attack now, you have done a mistake. <laughs> I've literally never saw a game where Marco Polo pre-constructed the Tekken one. So we play tested that matchup a lot. And one of the mistakes we've done is that as play testing proceeded, players got more and more experienced. And when you get more experienced, it is much easier to defend. And Marco Polo actually has some extremely powerful tools that can be just like roadblock the Kutulun player if used correctly. Um, and we saw that the win rate on Kutulun are going down. So we buffed the Kutulun cards. And when we released the game, all six matchups, there's four pre-constructed decks. Mm -hmm. All six matchups are somewhere between 45 and 55 win That's percent. pretty nice. For experienced players. Well, but they... 
yeah, what I didn't consider is that when newcomers come, they don't know how to defend with Marco Polo mm -hmm. and Cotulun just stream rolls over them. And we saw players getting frustrated about it. Um, one of the things that are going to happen with the expansion is that we're going to recommend tweaks to the pre-constructed decks that are hopefully going to be more newcomer friendly. That makes sense. I will say my own experience, and this is a good thing. I didn't feel that when I lost, it wasn't frustration as much as, all right, well, if I did this way now, you know, it's sort of that once you lose, you sort of go back in your mind, you think about how a different card interacts, especially because I am a fan of the, uh, this is a, by the way, a singleton format, or at least I'm pretty yes. sure the rule says. So it, this isn't like a, man, I didn't build my deck right. I should put three copies of this card in there. I don't feel bad about that. And just, I can put in just the cards I like. I agree. And I I think that one of the design decisions I'm happiest with is that I stuck to the singleton format where you can have up to one copy per card. The whole deck is 30 cards. Like there's many games where you see 50, 60, 70% of your deck. Um, so if you have this crazy plan that you want to execute, you can almost always execute it. It does keep games fresh and interesting. It does give us a lot of design space. So one of the things I learned from Netrunner is that the meta say, tends to become homogenous. And there are certain cards that are in almost every Netrunner deck. Ah, uh, yes, the staples. Yes, almost every Netrunner deck in the entire history of the game almost always has three copies of this particular card. And the Netrunner players out there, they know which cards I'm talking about. I can think of one for the, uh, the, the, the runner. Isn't there like you just get five credits? Or maybe yep. It's called Sure Gamble. You pay That's five. Yeah, nine. I was like, I, I think it's someone holding a hand of poker cards or something. And even if Wallbreakers has its staples, which by the way, I don't think it does, but even if it does, it's only B1 copy. Mm -hmm. So it does make the games much more heterogeneous. And when we play tested, there were so many different decks we could build and would still be competitive with the top decks of the format. Their win rate might suffer, but your decisions mattered, as opposed to Magic the Gathering, where if you bring a meta deck versus a homebrew, the homebrew is not going to win. Like The win rate is going to be 10 20%. So I'm really happy with the decision. I think it's one of the most awful, terrible ideas I ever had uh, to create a single tool format. It makes development horrendously expensive. Mm, it does. That <laughs> but, does make sense, yeah, because... Yes. You need to make a wider variety because you're assuming people need at least a minimum of 30 unique cards. I'm actually curious now with the expansion coming out, you know, obviously that, I assume that means people actually want to play this. They're excited, you know. Uh, do you think that you're going to be building a competitive scene? Because, I mean, you already have draft rules and stuff. And like you said, coming from Netrunner, they had tournaments and so did Magic, things of that nature. And most card games tend to People get excited about that. Do you think you're going to see that with World Breakers as well? So I really want it. I really want to because I'm a competitive player. I, I, kept, I kept saying when I played Runner, I kept saying that I play, net, I play one game of Netrunner a year. And that game is winning worlds, like winning the world championship. That is Netrunner for me. Um, I am all about the competitive drive. This is why I play games. Not just to win, to play competitively. I'm totally fine with losing. I mean, I'm, I'm disappointed, but in a healthy way. And I really wanted to build organized play support for Wallbreakers. The plans are there. Like, the prize support exists. I'm shelving it for now. And the reason is you need a critical mass yeah. of players to achieve it. And you need these players to go to the store owners and tell them, we want to do this. Because that's how you get the support from the store owners. And you cannot have organized play without the support of the store owners. So I am building the game as an experience. You play with your friends. Maybe you play it online. Um, I will probably arrange tournaments, um, either in Origins or in PAX Unplugged. And if I do, I will announce it. And we're going to have some cool stuff uh, for these tournaments. But from a strategic perspective, I'm focusing on this idea of you can open the box, you can play the game. 
when you're done, you set it aside. And when you want to play a game, again, you just do it. Um, I hope it's not going to be that way forever because one, there is a lot of interest. Like I was blown away by the amount of excitement and interest in wall breakers. Um, we sold out. Like the stock yeah, I sold think, out. Or I read something like you completely sold out worldwide and like near or at, or I guess now sold out in US. Yes. So we're sold out in Europe. We sold out in the US. We had a bunch of copies earmarked for Origins. We shipped them back to the warehouse. It was so expensive. <laughs> and now they're available again, but it's a handful. Like it's a couple of dozen copies that are still available. Um, after that, we're sold out. Uh, when I ordered the stock, it was supposed to be for six to nine months. It sold out in two weeks. So that's the excitement is there. Yeah. I mean, that definitely shows that there is the engagement that people want to actually play this game. Yes. So I'm talking to distributors, and at least some of them are interested. Um, once you get to distributors, it's much easier to get to a wider audience. Mm -hmm. So I think that the potential is there, the plans are there. If I get that critical mess, I will definitely go for organized play. Right now, I'm focusing all the resources on getting that critical mess and pushing the content and having players enjoy the game. If you're watching this video, go on the website, uh, check out Kickstarter. We're going to launch in early June. We're going to have the expansion. We're going to have the second printing of World Breakers. And we're going to have some cool stuff that players have been asking for. So a bit fancier, like right now, the tokens are all cardboard. We're going to offer fancier tokens as, um, as an add-on. So I hope that players enjoy these as well. Yeah. And before we go to the end, there's one question I always just like to ask, even though we did talk a lot about other games earlier. Is there a game you played recently that you think has been very interesting people to take a look at? Be it if it's something even it's popular and you think people should just play it or something, you know, that not a lot of people talk about, or even as a game designer, something that you think has a really cool game mechanic more people should know about. Certainly. So I love role-playing game. I haven't role-played in 12 years. And the big challenge with role-playing games is finding a good group um, that are really in sync with what you want to do. Um, but I actually broke that two days ago. I played Alice is Missing uh, with I've been to play two, that. <laughs> two close friends of mine. And um, we talked beforehand. We managed expectations. We talked about how we enjoy role playing. Uh, oh, here he is. He's yeah, so fluffy. Yeah. Oh, my gosh. Unfortunately, she snuck in. So we saw that we are really synced in how we enjoy role playing games. Mm -hmm. And we played Alice is Missing. It was perfect like we really followed i think the way the game is supposed to unwind so briefly alice is missing is a uh, dm less a gm less role-playing game where you are teenagers in this like quiet middle of nowhere american town your friend alice has disappeared she's a missing person no one has saw her in two days and all of you are connecting the pieces and trying to figure out where is alice what has happened to her um, the entire game is played over text messages. So you don't need to act. You don't need to like think about what my character is going to sound like and look like. And a big part of it is that you have time to think because text messages are asynchronous. So it really felt like something's happening. And I have a few seconds, even a couple of minutes, to decide how to respond to it. And the narrative that emerged from the experience was really sad and tragic and made sense, which is not always the case with this kind of improvisational uh, GM-less role-playing experiences. Mm -hmm. So I wholeheartedly enjoy it. I really recommend it. Um, you should be prepared. You can probably only play it once maybe twice with a completely different group. And you should manage expectations beforehand because the game does touch on issues like gender identity, uh, violence, bullying, uh, potentially uh, issues around mm -hmm. consent. Uh, so I would just make sure you're with people you trust mm -hmm. when you play the game, but it's totally worth it. Now, there is an expansion which may add some replayability. I think they just ran a Kickstarter for. And apparently enough people thought it was popular that, uh, you know, they're making a movie of it. I think it's a movie or a TV show. 
So uh, we will see more of that as uh, whenever they actually come out with that. But thank you so much for joining me on here. Is there, I mean, you've mentioned the Kickstarter, but is there anything else you want to uh, let people know where to follow you to keep up to date for whether it's World Breaker or just game talk you're having? So uh, worldbreakersgame.com. And uh, if you can, if you want, join the mailing list. You're going to get all the news. We're also on Twitter, uh, worldbreakersak. Uh, we're on Board Game Geek, so every new piece of news goes there. And finally, if that's your thing, we have a Discord channel, uh, and all the news go to Discord as well. So, whichever way you uh, you uh, consume your social media, we should have some presence there. All right, and of course, for those of you watching, you probably know this is Roll for Create, and you can find us on YouTube, Twitter, wherever you like to get your uh, dose of social media. But for now, thank you so much for joining me, Ellie, and I'm Will, and thank you so much for watching. This has been a Roll for Create interview.